The title I have this morning is Like the Model Shown to You. And you will see that this comes out of a verse here in Hebrews chapter 8. Verse 1. Now the main point of what we have to say is this. We have a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. Of course, this is Jesus that he's talking about. But there's something about Jesus as our high priest and something about the high priest as there was in the Old Covenant. The high priest was the, the uh, one presiding over the whole tribe of Levite, the Levites, the, the priestly tribe, right? The Levites were the priestly tribe, uh, the descendants of Aaron. And so when it's referring to Jesus as our high priest, he's not only saying that the, the Old Testament priesthood was a type and shadow, was a model for what is going to be in the body of Christ. You know, the Catholic Church grabbed on to that centuries ago where they said, well, the Pope is the, the head of the church. Okay, well, Jesus is the head of the church. Okay, and one of the things of what the Protestant Reformation uh, brought to Christianity was the idea that every Christian is a priest and that you don't need a man between you and God. Jesus is that man. And he is in heaven. That's what this verse is saying here, is that Jesus is our high priest in heaven. But for him to be a high priest means that there are low priests, right? And that's us. We, you are priests. Uh, oh, let me confirm that. I'm, this is not just my idea. Keep the place here in Hebrews 8. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse 9. You all know this verse, I'm sure. You understand he's talking to the church here. Not talking to the world. But he says, you, the church, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a dedicated nation, God's own purchased special people that you, the church, may set forth the wonderful deeds and display the virtues and the perfections. We're going to talk a little bit about perfections. Plural today. The perfections of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Okay, so you're priests. Got it? You're priests. As a Christian, you're a priest. And Jesus is our high priest. Okay, go back to um, Hebrews chapter 8. Verse 2. Jesus is an officiating priest, a minister in the holy places in the true tabernacle, which is erected not by man, but by the Lord. Okay, once again, he's drawing a, a, a correlation between the Old Testament priesthood in the tabernacle and then later in the temple with what actually is a spiritual reality now. Now, let me say some things about parables, types and shadows. We, we talked about this on Wednesday night. Um, you've got to be able to move beyond what you see, hear, smell, and taste in the physical to, to grasp the things of God. This is one of the things Jesus told his disciples. He said, they asked, well, why do you speak in, in symbolic language? And he said, well, because symbolic language is for those that really want to know, those who will seek God and who will press in. He said, if you don't want to seek God and you don't want to press in, you ain't going to get it. So, anyway, so speaking of 
the Old Testament tabernacle and the temple and the priests and the sacrifices and all of this stuff, it's symbolic. But it's symbolic of something which is greater, which is real, which is now, which is in a realm that we don't see, hear, smell, or taste in the physical, but we get it in our spirit. Okay? And Jesus is in that tabernacle, that heavenly tabernacle, now, as we speak, functioning as our high priest. Well, what's he doing? He's praying for us. <laughs> Hallelujah. We need it. <laughs> it's right? Okay. Verse 3. For every high priest is appointed to offer up gifts and sacrifices. So it is essential for this high priest, Jesus, to have some offering to make. Also, if he then were still living on the earth, he wouldn't be a priest at all because there are already priests who offer gifts in accordance with the law. But those offer service merely as a pattern, as a parable, right? As a foreshadowing of what has its true existence and reality in the heavenly sanctuary. For when Moses was about to erect the tabernacle, he was warned by God saying, See to it that you make it all exactly according to the copy, the model which was shown to you on the mountain. So even in setting up the Old Covenant, which was a, a symbol, by the way, he still had to do it right. He still had to do it according to something that God showed him. Well, God shows us stuff. God shows everybody. Let me give you that. Keep the place here. Go to Romans chapter 1. God reveals and demonstrates His existence. He demonstrates His principles. He de demonstrates His truth. He demonstrates things that you're not going to see on the 6 o'clock news. He demonstrates things you're not going to be taught in school. But He shows it to you in your inner man. Romans chapter 1, verse 19. It says, For that which is known about God is evident to humanity and made plain in their inner consciousness because God Himself has shown it to them. You know, Owen used to say, you don't have to tell a sinner they're a sinner. They know in their hearts they're a sinner. They may justify and say, well, it was just the way I was mistreated when I was a child. Or it's, it's the Democrats' fault. Or it's the Republicans' fault or whatever. So they justify it. But in their heart, when they're sinning, they know this is wrong. They do it anyway. But they know. But God shows it to them. That, see, that's the Holy Spirit. One of His jobs is to convict of sin. Now, to convict, there's a difference between to indict and to convict in the legal sense. An indictment means a charge has been brought against you. You've been accused of something. Well, that's what the devil does. He, he indicts. But to convict means a, a judge or a jury has examined the facts and they have made a determination. Okay, this happened or this didn't happen. And the conviction means, okay, it happened and you're guilty and so we, we move on from here, whatever that might entail. Well, that's conviction. See, there's a difference between conviction and condemnation. Uh, condemnation is just the accusation. But conviction means, okay, yeah, that's right. And so if God convicts somebody, yeah, you're a sinner, it's like, yeah, I know. I know I'm a sinner. Okay, so, um, because God has made it, it made it plain to them in their inner consciousness. For ever since <clears throat> the creation of the world, God's invisible nature and attributes, that is, His eternal power and divinity, have been made intelligible and clearly discernible through the things that have been made, His handiworks. 
So men are without excuse altogether without defense or justification. Okay. So there's that. Now go back to Hebrews chapter 8. <clears throat> See, in verse 5 he was saying that God showed Moses a model, but a model is not the real deal. You know, I love trains. And at North Park at Christmas time <coughs> in, in Dallas, they have this, this play that comes there every year. I guess it still does, of model railroads. They've got the whole part of the mall just with little HO model train tracks and all little villages and everything. But those are just models. A real locomotive is taller than this room here. <laughs> okay, and you don't want to be hit by one. <laughs> okay. So the model is just a, a depiction, and some of those models are really lifelike, but it's still a model. So what God showed Moses <clears throat> and what God shows us from his word is still only whatever we are able to grasp. The, the reality of it is much, much bigger, much more vast than what we can comprehend. And so in verse 6 it says, but as it is now Christ Jesus has acquired a priestly ministry which is as much superior and more excellent to the old covenant as <clears throat> of which he now Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant is more superior and excellent because the new covenant is enacted and rests upon more important, more sublime, higher and nobler promises. Well, now I read that verse and I was puzzled by the, the use of the word Jesus has acquired something. Because if you acquire something, that means... That implies, at least the way the word is used in English, and the meaning of the word in Greek is somewhat like the way we use it in English. If you acquire something, that means you didn't have it before. You know, if you acquire a, a new car, that means you didn't have a, have a new car. You had an old car, or you had no car at all. Okay, so, but it's like, well, wait a minute. Now, Jesus had everything that there is. Well, let me give you that. Keep the place here. Go to Hebrews chapter 2. So this will tell us here what he acquired, and it will make clear what my, it will clear up the confusion I had about saying, well, Jesus acquired something. It's like, well, Jesus has got everything. He doesn't need anything else. Well, let me read this to you and see if the, the wording will make this clear. Hebrews 2, verse 10. For it was an act worthy of God and fitting to the divine nature that he, this is speaking of Jesus, for whose sake and by whom all things have their existence. Well, see right there, God, it says Jesus has all things, so why does he need to acquire something? Ray, keep reading. Okay in bringing many sons into glory, well, guess what? We hadn't got to glory yet, have we? So Jesus is acquiring us. Right? All right. Bringing many sons into glory should make the pioneer of their salvation uh, perfect. And what that word means is to come to maturity. Make it perfect through suffering. Go to verse 17. It explains that a little bit more. It says, So it was evident that it was essential that Jesus be made like his brethren, like us, in every respect in order that he might become a merciful, sympathetic, and faithful high priest in the things related to God to make atonement and propitiation for people's sins. For because he himself has, been, has suffered and being tempted, tested, and tried, he's able immediately 
to run to the cry of and assist and relieve those who are being tempted and tested and tried and are therefore exposed to suffering. Keep reading. Next verse. Chapter 3, verse 1. So then, brethren, consecrated and set apart for God, who share in the heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest whom we have confessed as ours when we embraced the Christian faith. Consider Jesus. Think about Jesus as he is right now. Go to Hebrews chapter 6. It will tell you about that. What is Jesus like right now? Where is he right now? What is he doing right now? He's in the heavenly tabernacle interceding for us as our high priest. All right. Chapter 6, verse 19. Now we have a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul which cannot slip or break down under whoever steps out upon it. This is referring to our faith. Our hope, our hope, our faith, our belief, our trust, that reaches farther and enters into the very certainty of the presence within the veil where Jesus has entered into us for us in advance, where he is now a forerunner, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Well, to acquire us, the word acquire in the Greek, the way Strong's Concordance says it, is to make something ready. See, it's not just that I mean, you could say, well, we belong to Jesus anyway, whether we've come to perfection or not. Okay. I mean, we, we give ourselves to him, and so we belong to him. Uh, that's what being a Christian is, is you've, you've committed your life to him. You've, you've joined his team, so to speak. So, so he, does, he has acquired us, but are we ready to enter into the presence in the Holy of Holies yet? Not quite. So that's what acquiring means, to make it ready or to, to come to pass for, for the, the process to be complete. See, that's what Jesus is in the process of acquiring. But it describes his priesthood this way. Go to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11. Go to 7-11. Or you can go to quick... A quick trip or a racetrack or wherever you go. Okay. Uh, Hebrews 7.11. Now if that perfection, that, that being made ready, a perfect fellowship between God and the worshiper had been attainable by the Levitical priesthood because under it people were given the law, then why was it further necessary that there should arise another and different kind of priest, one after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one appointed by the rank of uh, Aaron. And verse 15, it says, For this becomes more plainly evident when another priest arises, which is Jesus, who bears the likeness of Melchizedek, who has been constituted a priest, not on the basis of a bodily legal requirement, but on the basis and power of an endless and indestructible life. And we can read that and say, well, yeah, okay, Jesus, he rose from the dead and he's never going to die anymore. But what about us as Christians? Well, even if you did die, says the trumpet's going to blow and the dead in Christ are going to rise imperishable. You know, it says that in 1 Corinthians 15. Well, that means if you died as a Christian, then when the seventh trumpet blows, you, you arise with a new body and you're not ever going to die again. That's an endless and indestructible life. 
So the Melchizedek priesthood is our priesthood. Jesus is the high priest after the order or the model, if you will, set up by Melchizedek. Now I could go through the whole story of Abraham got caught up in this war going on between left and right back there in Sodom to, to rescue his nephew Lot, which is kind of like the body of Christ getting caught in all the political turmoil that we're in today. And he was met right in the middle of that conflict by this person, Melchizedek, who we never see again in the Bible other than it says Jesus is, is that that was a model of who Jesus is. Maybe it actually was Jesus going back there and stepping into the middle of that situation just like he did with Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego in the fiery furnace. He can do that, you know. He, he, he's in the eternity of eternities. He can go forward. He can go backwards. He can go to Pluto. He can go to Dallas. He can go wherever he needs to go. So let's not trouble ourselves with who or what Melchizedek was. Let's just look at that as it's a priesthood with an endless and indestructible life. And that is who Jesus is and that's who we are in him. I, th I could say amen and you've gotten the point, but let's, let's elaborate on this a bit. Go to Psalm 110. This is familiar to us too, I dare say. The 110th Psalm, verse 1. The Lord God the Father says to my Lord Jesus Christ, Sit at my right hand until I make your adversaries your footstool. That's one of the most quoted verses of the Old Testament that's quoted in the New Testament, right there. The Lord will send forth from Zion the scepter of your strength. Rule then in the midst of your foes. Well, let me just suggest that that doesn't mean go to Washington, D.C. and try to rule or go to Hollywood and try to rule. The midst of your foes is what's in the middle of you. You know, it's your thoughts, your feelings, your desires. That's the midst where you are to rule. In fact, if you don't rule there, you can't rule anywhere. Okay, verse 3. Your people will offer themselves willingly in the day of your power, in the beauty of holiness and in holy array, out of the womb of the morning, will spring forth your young men who are as the dew. Well, what's he talking about there? Well, first of all, he's talking about a day. The day of his power. Right now, we're not really seeing the power of Jesus Christ fully manifested in the earth. Okay, yes, people are getting saved. People are getting healed. There are miracle things happening. So his power is being displayed in the earth. But right now... 1 John 5.19 is still in effect. Is The whole world is still under the power of the enemy. Well, we're gonna, a minute, in a minute, I'm going to show you how that operates and why we don't have to be under that. But by default, by, when the fault's in us, we are under that. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute, but let, let's keep reading here. Okay. Shall spring forth your young men who are as the dew. What's he talking about? Well, first of all, young men, is it, it's, uh, you know, 1 John talks about the young men who are strong. Well, go to, to Revelation chapter 12. Keep the place here in Psalm 110. We've been over this a lot, especially if you come on Friday night. Revelation 12 A, a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, with a crown-like garland of 
stars, 12 stars on her head, and she was pregnant, and she cried out in her birth pangs in the midst of her delivery. And another ominous sign was seen in heaven. Behold, a huge fiery red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven kingly crowns on his head. His tail swept across the sky and dragged down a third of the stars, flinging them to earth. And the dragon stationed himself in front of the woman who was about to be delivered so that he might devour her child as soon as she brought it forth. But she brought forth a male child, the young man who is as the dew, as it says. Right? That's who she brought forth in verse 5. Who is destined to rule all the nations with an iron staff and her child was caught up, was harpazoed, was raptured, if you will, to God and to his throne. Now I want to correct something here that tradition has been confused about. Tradition has always said, well, the woman is, is Israel, or the woman is uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the, man child, the male child is Jesus, because said, see, he was caught up to his throne. No, Jesus was not harpazoed. What was Jesus? Well, in Acts chapter 1, go there, keep the place here. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, this is when Jesus is uh, ascends to the Father, okay? Verse 8. Eight, he says, you shall receive. He's talking to the, a crowd of people that is, has come to see him off, as it were. And he said, you shall receive power, ability, efficiency, and might when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. And when he had said this, even as they were looking at him, he was caught up. Well, guess what? They have mistranslated that word. That is not harpezo there. It, it's a different word. It does, see, harpezo means you're seized or you're grabbed. It doesn't say he was grabbed. It's, it's more like he floated away. And in, in Acts chapter 3... When, Paul, when Peter rather, is preaching about this, in verse 21, he describes Jesus as catching a, a, a way that way. Uh, chap, Acts chapter 3, verse 21. It says, speaking of Jesus, it says, whom heaven must receive. Jesus wasn't grabbed he floated away, or he, he flew off, as it were. Now, most Christians, well, what's the difference between being harpazoed and being epistrephoed? Well, there's a big difference. The, the difference is, he wasn't, he wasn't taken without his intention of it. Okay, now, I'm not saying that we don't intend to be raptured, but... Let me say, it's not your decision. You know, I, I want to get raptured. I wanted to get raptured yesterday. <laughs> you know, most of the church say, hey, take me out of here, God. Or, or, or else they'll say, well, I'm not going to be here when everything gets bad. How do you know you're not going to be here when everything gets bad? Just because you want it? See, that you get raptured because it's a harpezo. Jesus ascended to the Father because it wasn't a harpezo. It, it was... He said, he, it was a decision on his part, and it's like, uh, come, swing low, sweet chariot, come take me home. That, see, that's the difference than a rapture. But in the church, it's like it's all one thing. Anyway, I'm, I'm digressing. Go back to Revelation chapter 12. It says that the young men who are as the do, will be caught up to God and to His throne. Well, this, of course, relates back to what we were reading in Psalm 110. Keep the, keep the place in Revelation. Let's go back to Psalm 110. Psalm 
verse 5. The Lord at your right hand will shatter kings in the day of his indignation. Well, this again refers to something in the book of Revelation. Keep the place in Psalm 110. Go back to the book of Revelation. Chapter 11, verse 18. This is what happens when Jesus comes back to take dominion. The seventh trumpet blows, the dead in Christ arise, and it says in verse 18, the heathen raged, but God's wrath came, his indignation came, the time when the dead will be judged and your servants the prophets rewarded and those who revere your name, both high and small and great, and the time for destroying the corruptors of the earth. That's what's being described back over there in Psalm 110. Okay, you can let the place in Revelation go. Go back to Psalm 110. Verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not revoke or change it. You are a priest forever after the order, after the model of Melchizedek. All right, that's the point we've being made, that that's, that's the, the priesthood that Jesus has received. And if we're priests, if we're a, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, we're not Levitical priests, we're Melchizedek priests. All right, got that? Well, let's see what that entails. That's like, well, that's real good. Okay, I'll put it on a put it on a plaque here on the wall. Melchizedek priest Ray Andrews, or Melchizedek priest Mariah Lopez, or whatever your name is. Okay, no, it's not just an honorary title. What is it then? What 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 does you being a Melchizedek priest entitle you to do or to be? I'm so glad you asked. Let's go to Second Peter chapter one. Verse 17. Now, I believe you do get, don't you, that Jesus is our model. That Melchizedek was the model that Jesus, that was the type and shadow that Jesus is. Well, Jesus is the model of who we are you know, okay, if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C and B equals C. Right? That's a math problem. You got it? We do spiritual mathematics here sometimes. Okay? All right. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 17. For when He, Jesus, was invested with honor and glory from God the Father, and a voice was born to him by the splendid majestic glory from the, the bright cloud that overshadowed him. See, this was on the Mount of Transfiguration. And the voice said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased and delight. Peter says, We actually heard this voice born out of heaven, for we were together with him on the holy mountain. But get this in verse 19. But we have a prophetic word made firmer still. You will do well to pay close attention to it as to a lamp shining in a dismal, squalid, and dark place until the day breaks through the gloom and the morning star rises and comes into being in your hearts. What is he talking about? The morning star? Okay, you know, yes, you look over into the east right before the sun comes up. And yes, the sun comes up in the east. <laughs> David found out some people don't know that. But right before the sun comes up, sometimes the planet Venus is over on that side of things and it will be a bright star in the morning right before the sun comes up. 
It'll be a, the brightest object in the sky until the sun, which becomes the brightest object in the sky, comes up. Do you see the metaphor? Yeah. The morning star arising in our hearts means that we will arise to this position of glory and excellence before Jesus actually comes back and assumes the full sunlight of His glory uh, over all the world. But it means more than that. This, this is where, this is something I think most Christians haven't pressed in deeper to get. Why does it refer to that as the morning star other than just a metaphor of celestial uh, objects moving around in the sky? I mean, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty picture, but why did he pick that? And, and what bearing does that have upon spiritual reality? Well, it has this. Satan, before he fell, was called the morning star. He was called Halel, which really literally translates the day star. Which the King James, instead of the word morning star, the King James says until the day star arises in your hearts. What you're saying that Satan's going to arise in my heart? No, we're not talking about Satan. We're talking about who he was before he fell. He was Lucifer. So whatever Satan was before he fell, God has that in mind for his people to occupy that position of authority. And let's talk about the authority that Satan or Lucifer had because if we fully understood that, we'd understand how he's doing everything he's doing in this world. Because all he's doing is all that he did before, but he's just twisted it. You know, that's the way it is. If you learn something, you know, you've got it. If you've practiced something over and over, then you, do, you know how to do that thing. And even if you do it for the wrong purposes, you know, I, I learned my scales and my chords and arpeggios and all that stuff back in the day, so if I want to go out and play rock and roll with that technique, I can do it. I'm not saying I should do it, but it's the same technique, right? Well, Satan had some techniques when he was the archangel Lucifer, and he simply is using those same techniques for evil. For his, for his selfish purpose. Let's talk about this. Go to Isaiah chapter 14. See, if we'll understand this, we'll understand who we're supposed to be. Or maybe I should say it, it's because the church doesn't understand this that the church doesn't move up to the place God would like the church to be. And why we get caught up in some of Satan's deception. Because we don't see how he does what he does and what he did before and how he's using that against us now. Okay, he, uh, Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, O light bringer, day star, son of the morning. Bingo. It's a description of a office, if you will. It's a, a position of a high exalted position. How you have been cut down to the ground, you who weakened and laid low the nations. You have said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the assembly of the uttermost north. <coughs> Let me stop you right here. None of the things that he was saying that he was going to do were necessarily evil in themselves. The only thing that made it evil was he saying he was going to do it through his power. You know, we as Christians, as word-believing Christians... We can claim the promises of God. We can stand on the word. We can make our good confession. We can make our proclamation. But are we doing it for self? Or are we doing it to 
accomplish what God wants. You know, by His stripes I'm healed. Do we claim our healing so we can go out and do what we want to do? Or do we claim our healing so that we can be more effective for God? You see, it's not saying healing is wrong. It's saying what your motive for claiming it would be right or wrong. Okay? You've said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the assembly of the, the uttermost north. That's Mount Zion, by the way, and God says that's where we're supposed to sit. So ain't nothing wrong with sitting on Mount Zion. Revelation 14 says that's where the 144,000 are going to be. Well, they're not going to be sitting there. They're going to be standing there, but still. It's not saying that there's anything wrong with being on Mount Zion. It's just, are you going to get there on your own power, or are you going to ask God to get you there? It says, you will be brought down to Sheol. That's what happened to him. Now, or what will happen to him, ultimately. Now go to Ezekiel chapter 28. Verse 12. Ezekiel 28, 12. Still talking about Lucifer before he fell. Now I know here in verse 12 it sounds like Ezekiel's talking to the king of Tyre. Well, it applied to the king of Tyre metaphorically, but he's really describing Satan's character here. He says, you, the last half of the verse says, you are the full measure or the pattern of exactness, the model, <laughs> full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Now, watch this. R read this here. Every precious stone was your covering. The carnelian, the topaz, the jasper, chrysolite, beryl, onyx, sapphire, carbuncle, and emerald. And your settings and your sockets and engravings were wrought in gold. And on the day that you were created, they were prepared. And we can read, oh, well, that's very interesting. Keep the place here. Go to Exodus chapter 28. Remember what God told Moses about the tabernacle? He said, make it like the model in the heavenlies. What did it say about Lucifer in verse 12 here? He was the perfect model of something. Right? And as the perfect model, it says his covering, his protection, his, his, pow his power, his claim to fame in the angelic realm was that he was covered with precious stones. And it names them. Exodus chapter 28, verse 15. Okay, it's talking about the breastplate that the high priest wears. High priest, right? Okay. You shall make a breastplate of judgment. Verse 15. You shall make a breastplate of judgment in skilled work, like the workmanship of an ephod. You shall make it with gold, blue, purple, and scarlet stuff, and a fine twined linen. The breastplate shall be square and doubled. A span shall be its length, and a span shall be its breadth. You shall set in it four rows of stones. The sardius, the topaz, the carbuncle, the emerald, the sapphire, the diamond, the jacinth, the agate, the amethyst, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper. And they shall be set in gold. What did we read over there in Ezekiel chapter 28 about Lucifer? 
He had all these stones and they were set in gold. Now, God is telling Moses to have the high priest's breastplate with all these jewels set in gold. Now, there's some deep symbolism in there. But the point I'm making is Lucifer was in a priestly position in the angelic realm before he fell. And go back to Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 14. It, speaking of him, it says, You were the anointed cherub. If he was anointed, that means God put him there for a purpose. Okay? That covers with overshadowing. And I set you so. See, this is telling us what Lucifer was and it's also telling us what he has corrupted himself to be now. Wealth is his strong suit. Not just jewels, but money. Not just money, but electronic currency, uh, bonds, stocks, real estate, all of that. that that's his realm. He, he knows that realm. Okay? And he overshadows. He knows how to, to, to spread out. He knows how to publicize. He knows how to influence. He knows how to manipulate. He knows how to get people's attention and mesmerize. Okay? That's overshadowing. And God set him so on the holy mountain. And he walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Well, what are the stones of fire? I don't know. Electronic, uh, electromagnetic forces or something. I don't know. I'm not sure exactly what that is, but you can be sure Satan's got his hands on it. Okay? You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until iniquity and guilt were found in you. Through the abundance of your commerce, you were filled with lawlessness and violence, and you sinned. And therefore I cast you out as a profane thing from the mountain of God, and the guardian cherub drove you out of the midst of the stones of fire. But you see, don't you, that he was in an exalted position. And that there was nothing wrong with the exalted position except that he misused it. That he perverted it and twisted it for his selfish purpose. Which he was, how should I say, allowed, he was free to do. Because that's the way God creates things. God creates things to where they can go this way or they can go that way or they can go down the middle. See, it's what Steve's been talking about. Nobody's going to make you vote a certain way right now. You can vote Republican or you can vote Democrat or you cannot vote or you can vote for another party or you can write in Jesus or whatever. See, it's like that's your choice, your free will. That's the way God creates things. Now, some Christians don't believe that. I'm sorry. <laughs> he, he, he did create it that way, and that's what happened with Lucifer. God didn't make Lucifer do all of that. He chose to do it, and voila, here we are. Right. But what's he doing? He's doing that. And what does God want us to do? He wants us to do the right version of that. He wants us to be priests says the man-child is destined to rule and reign. That's our destiny, folks. But we've got to do it God's way and not Lucifer's way. We've got to take the power that's been given to us by God and use it God's way and not man's way. And if there's one thing that is bringing criticism against the Church of Jesus Christ in America right now, it's the fact that ministers and ministries are taking what God has given and using it their way instead of God's way. Go back to 2 Peter. Go back to 2 Peter chapter 1. I need to bring this to a close because we are going to have the Lord's Supper this morning. 2 Peter chapter 1. In verse 19, he makes a very important point here. 
he says, we have the prophetic word from her still. It's all in the word. You do well to pay attention to it as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the morning star comes into being in our hearts. So how is this transformation of us into ones that God can entrust with ruling and reigning? How is that going? How are we going to get from point A to there? By paying attention, close, careful attention to the Word. I'll give you this. 2 Timothy chapter 1. See, when I say pay attention, it doesn't mean just, just sit there like a bump on a log and just take it in. I mean, okay, start there. That's a good place to start, I guess. Just, just listen. But it's more than that. 2 Timothy 1, verse 13. Hold fast and follow the pattern. Like the model, right? Hold fast to the pattern of wholesome and sound teaching which you have heard in all faith and love which are for us in Christ Jesus. And guard and keep with greatest care the precious and excellently adapted truth which has been entrusted to you with the help of the Holy Spirit who makes his home in us. You see, if you don't guard and keep what God has shown you, the devil is going to come and try to snatch it from you. We talked about that on Wednesday, about the parable of the seeds. And there's a lot of the ways that the devil steals the word from Christians. I'm not saying that he steals their salvation. Jesus said in John chapter 10, he can't do that. If you're a Christian and you end up in hell, it was your own fault. It's not. You can't say, well, the devil just took me and I didn't want to go. <laughs> But, but, I'm not, I'm not, okay, we're not talking, I'm not trying to make you doubt your salvation here. What I'm trying to make you do is understand that just because you have heard and received the word, even with joy, it says in the parable of the seeds, uh, it says that the devil can come along and, and snatch it with the birds of the air or the trials and circumstances and persecution and trouble can come and it can just burn you up and if you don't have any root, then you fall away. Or the cares of life, just the business of this world can just preoccupy you so much that you kind of put the word off on the shelf and after a while you forget, what, what is that? Kind of like my glasses this morning. I was looking for my glasses. Oh, where are my glasses? Well, it's like, well, where was that? Now, what did God say about it? What, what, what am I supposed to do here? you got to guard and keep it. Amen, Brother Ben, with the right brother's pen. <laughs> Father, help us guard and keep your word. You've entrusted it to us with the help of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so help us Realize the wealth that is in your word that is greater than all the wealth of the world, greater than the, the precious stones that, that Lucifer covered himself with, greater than the, the wealth in the church in America today. That your, your wealth is not jewels. Your wealth is not bank accounts. Your wealth is not property. Your wealth is you. Christ in us, the hope of glory.